moving on now, we're going to be discussing chapter 21, section 3, which deals with nuclear radiation, especially uh, exposure, detection, and its uh, effects. But first of all, we have to discuss the differences in terms of uh, protection against the three types of radiation. For example, alpha radiation only tra travels a few millimeters in air and can be stopped with paper. Beta, on the other hand, uh, because it's so light and moving so fast, travels a few meters in air and has to be stopped with lead or glass. Now, gamma, the last of the radiation, uh, because it has no mass and no charge, uh, travels, it, it's very difficult to stop. Uh, so you can sort of mitigate the effects with lead, but realistically some gamma radiation is going to get through regardless. Moving on now to radiation exposure. Radiation can be damaging to human cells, mostly because they can get in and uh, knock out chunks of your DNA, which can then cause cancer and whatnot. But in order to uh, measure how much of an effect a certain amount of radiation is having, you have to determine how much radiation you're getting. And we measure that usually with the Röntgen, which is uh, the radiation equivalent of ionizing 2 times 10 to the 9 uh, ion pairs, basically, from neutral air within uh, 1 cubic centimeter of air. And we usually measure this in REM, which is the Röntgen equivalent for man or mankind. Uh, and most people usually get about 0.1 rem per year. And this will vary if you fly a lot, like you're a pilot, or if you live higher up, you're going to get a higher rem per year just because you get more exposure to cosmic rays and less protection from atmosphere. Moving on now to detecting radiation to determine how much harm you're actually faced with uh, when you're exposed to radiation. There's two main uh, devices we use to measure radiation. One is film badges and the other are Geiger counters. Now film badges are basically exactly what they sound like. They're squares of photosensitive film like you'd have in old cameras instead of before you had digital CCDs uh, and basically the exposure, so how dark it gets due to exposure, uh, is proportional to how much radiation you get. So you can wear a photo badge or a film badge all day rather and then take it off and get a very visible account of how much radiation you've actually been facing. And this is good for measuring, you know, over the course of a long time, how much radiation you're exposed to. Geiger counters, on the other hand, uh, are those big handheld things you've seen probably in movies and whatnot with, you know, the cord coming out and the uh, little stick on the end that has the dial and, you know, it'll beep every time you get a hit of radiation. So it counts the electric pulses released in air by ionizing radiation. So this isn't good for counting over long periods of time. However, you can visibly hear with the tick, 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 uh, how much radiation you're getting at any given point. So now we're going to look at applications of nuclear radiation, the first of which is radioactive dating. The most uh, common of which I can think of is carbon-14 dating. So there's a known proportion of Earth's atmosphere that is carbon-14 at any given point because carbon-12 goes up to the top part of the atmosphere and gets bombarded with extra particles which it can then absorb to become carbon-14. And this will eventually decay into uh, nitrogen and, you know, a uh, beta particle, basically. And so by measuring the proportion of carbon-14 to its more common cousin, carbon-12, in living tissue, you can determine the age, or not living tissue, organic tissue. Uh, the next is in medicine. Often, if you've ever heard of a PET scan, that stands for positron emission something or other tool, what have you. Basically, they put some sort of positron emitter, uh, some sort of iodine uh, or what have you inside, and then the positrons 
because they are antiparticles, will combine with an electron and annihilate, releasing a certain spectrum of light. And based on where these positron emitters go and where they can see the light, they can find, you know, cancers in bones and whatnot. And this makes it what is known as a radioactive tracer. In other words, it's something that goes to a specific part of the body, say a bone tumor or a certain section of the brain, and then emits a certain type of radiation. And you can use detectors to determine how big that tumor is, which part of the brain for study you should be looking at, etc. And the last one is for agriculture. Now, basically, you can do the same thing with a radioactive tracer in your fertilizer. And as it goes up the plant, you can see where the radioactive tracers are going to and how much of it is actually getting absorbed. You know, if the vast majority of your radioactive tracer is still in the soil, you can say it's not a very effective fertilizer because it's not existing in the plant very much. You can also prolong the shelf life of things by putting gamma emitters in your plants and these will kill off bacteria which are you know slightly bigger than gamma rays but get absolutely destroyed by them and this helps sanitize our food moving on now we're going to be discussing discussing rather fission and fusion now fission is essentially the breakup of a nucleus into smaller parts so fission would be this example right here. We have U-235 breaking up into two smaller uh, atoms. Oppositely, fusion is what we have going on down here, where you have two deuterium nuclei combining to form a helium nuclei. So fusion is the combination of smaller nuclei to form larger ones. And both fission and fusion release immense energy. Fusion more so than fission. Fission is what we use for nuclear power plants as well as uh, what powered the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs. And fusion is what powers the stars. So our sun as well as most stars that are like it. Now it should be noted that uh, fission produces a lot of nuclear waste and often these waste products can have half-lives in the thousands of, of years. So you need to, uh, I mean they're radioactive for that whole time, so you need to keep them away from the general populace uh, during that time to prevent radiation exposure, cancer, burns, etc. Uh, and this is often done through storage in big concrete bunkers, you know, you throw the stuff in there, or within water, within giant concrete and steel bunkers, until it is moved to some sort of underground facility, usually under a mountain or on a desert floor. And this disposal underground is meant to be a permanent solution to prevent anyone from getting to the spent fuel rods that could create some sort of dirty bomb, some nuclear weapon, or just generally keeping people away from the radiation.